Hello, everyone. Uh, it is an honor to be here today with all of you. It is early morning here in Hawaii, so my apologies if I sound sleepy during my lecture. Uh, but first of all, a great big thank you to all the men and women listening in that are working to bring Bitcoin to its optimality. I also want to thank the rest of the team at the Bitcoin Association, Jimmy, Raylene, Brendan, Joshua, and everyone else working extremely hard to raise awareness of the opportunities and capabilities that Bitcoin is able to provide the world. Of course, a special thank you to Dr. Wright and Steve Shatters and the rest of the team at Enchain for all of their great and tireless work. Bitcoin is needed now more than ever before, and Bitcoin SV is able to provide the promise of peer-to-peer -peer digital cash and significantly more. Today, we'll explore a topic that is very special. We will learn about what Bitcoin's blockchain is, and more importantly, its role in the global public ledger. First, let me entertain you with a little perspective broadening history. While not as well regarded as the invention of the wheel, the practice of shaping stone into easily stackable blocks was just as significant. Our homes and fortresses, our libraries and schools, our factories and places of business have relied on the security, structural integrity, and ease of construction that blocks allow for. These sculpted blocks that the Incas are famous for actually remind me of the adjustable block sizes on Bitcoin. In the case of Bitcoin, the blocks become digital, just as stone blocks form the structure of the Great Pyramids. So does the chain of blocks form the structure of the Bitcoin ledger. Just a quick little deviation here. How many of you have heard of the time pyramid? Don't worry, this is not on the test because, well, there is no test, but uh, they are building this pyramid at a rate of one block per 10 years. And the block subsidy will run out at some point in 3183. <laughs> it's, it's not a really good joke, but anyways. Uh, since the time pyramid only consists of three blocks so far, it's not much to look at. The Ashango bone is the earliest example we have of a ledger. It is a tally stick made from the fibula of a baboon with a sharp piece of quartz affixed to one end. While we don't know what was being recorded on the Ashango bone, we do know that these tally sticks were an ancient memory aid device used to record and document economic transactions, quantities, or even messages, much like Bitcoin today. Now, when we're trying to understand incentives within a technology, what we are looking to do is to understand how we interact with that technology and how that technology changes us through that interaction. If we look at the history of ledgers, we can see that as our ledgers change, our society changes with them. For example, our current financial system would not fit on clay tablets. Now, one of the more significant developments in the advancement of ledgers prior to Bitcoin was the invention of the double entry ledger. This made it possible to lend money at scale. In Italy, where the double entry method was established, people began to lend out money for interest. In time, this led to a tremendous amount of growth as businesses began to flourish. Italy became a prominent economic power that went on to establish global trade routes and lead the Renaissance. The double entry ledger is a system of bookkeeping in which every entry to an account requires a corresponding and opposite entry to a different account. The double entry has two equal and corresponding sides known as debit and credit. So this is what we've been using for the last 526 years since Leonardo da Vinci's friend Luca Pacoli invented it in, in 1494. Uh, and this is a picture of the gentleman there in the hooded robe. He was a monk and Leonardo was not just a friend, they were also co-workers and housemates in Milan. Bitcoin combines the time-tested integrity of the stone block with the information recording capabilities of a ledger. This is multiplied by the near instant connectivity of the World Wide Web, resulting in the first global public ledger. From this, we can begin to see that the Bitcoin ledger is significantly more than its chains of, chain of blocks. Rather, it is the information ordered by those blocks that make up the ledger. Nonetheless, we must pay particular attention to how Bitcoin's chain of blocks is formed and the incentives that drive usage of the, less, of the ledger. So just as stone blocks form the structure of the pyramids, so does the chain of blocks form the structure of the Bitcoin ledger. But empty blocks provide nothing for the ledger. 
It is the transactions within the blocks that shape the ledger. Perhaps a clearer way of saying this is that the validated transactions are the ledger and the blocks are the structure in which they are ordered and recorded. Why do we need blocks? In Bitcoin, there is no means of centralized decision-making. So each node must operate individually within the rules of Bitcoin to form a consensus on the ordering of events. A block allows for such an ordering to take place by creating a digital proof using the combination of the previous blocks hash and the hash of the new transactions to create a timestamp. Combining these elements forms a block of data that is subjected to proof of work and then built upon by other nodes, creating a chain of timestamp data filled blocks that form a single agreed upon transaction history. How are blocks formed? A Bitcoin block consists of an ordered set of transactions. The network considers each transaction to be a separate item or event and builds the blocks as such. As transactions are received into the network, nodes assemble them in structured database entries called blocks. Blocks are a timestamp for all the transactions they contain and represent proof of existence for the information within. In order to connect the block to the previous blocks in the chain, a block's header must include the hash of the block upon which it is built. This link forms a single chain of valid blocks leading back to the very first block. After the transactions are added into a block template, nodes perform work on a difficulty puzzle that must be solved to form a valid block. The solution proves that the node proposing the block has performed the work necessary for that block to be valid. Every time a new block is added to the chain, the cumulative proof of work built upon all previous blocks is increased. In this way, as time passes, transactions become more secure. When a node finds a valid block, each transaction is published as a part of that block and through the hash, a transaction can be provenly shown to have existed at the time the block was found. Blocks are broadcast across the whole Bitcoin network and are accepted or rejected by the rest of the nodes that are competing to build blocks. So now uh, I wanted to kind of mix it up a little bit with a little true or false. Uh, so if a node, wishes to alter a past transaction, it only needs to redo the proof of work for the block containing that transaction. So if you can just think of your answer in the head, true or false, and uh, I'll give you another second there. The answer is false. Nodes would have to redo the proof of work for that block and all other subsequent blocks proof of work and then must maintain a leading chain reflecting those changes in order to fool others. This process of attempting to make invalid transactions appear valid is costly as the attacking node must maintain a majority of the network hash. And even then the attack is easily reversed as the honest chain overtakes the dishonest chain. Once this occurs an attacker's transactions are void and their investment in proof of work is lost. Additionally, such attacks are fully visible, making them legally risky for operators of dishonest nodes. The very nature of proof of work is such that the process cannot be faked or mirrored. By mirrored, I mean in the case of a fork in a proof of stake chain, a node keeps its stake coins on both chains. If this was the case with proof of work, for every fork we have had, there would be an additional ASIC magically appearing for each of the ASICs already in existence, which is very silly. This brings me to an important point I want to make about proof of work. Proof of work ties the virtual to the physical in that there are real resources being used to secure the ledger. The ASICs needed to, need to be manufactured, electrical utilities consumed, internet infrastructure installed and maintained. These operations are an investment that singles a financial commitment to building blocks. Again, something that is impossible to fake and is in reality a very respectable business in which nodes become identifiable transaction processors. And so this requirement that a node uses CPU to cycle through combinations of nonce and block header in order to participate in the block building process 
is a big part of the incentive for nodes to behave honestly. Bitcoin has a long history of confusion as to who is and isn't a node. It's quite simple, really, as those that don't participate in building blocks are not nodes, but rather peers. So here we go with another question, true or false? Since nodes are engaged in the competitive business of building blocks, they require the complete record of all previous transactions in order to be able to build new valid blocks. I'll give you a second. The answer is false. Let's, found out, let's find out why. Once a transaction has been mined into a block, which has then been expanded on by the network, that transaction record is immutable. This means that anyone with a copy of that transaction can prove that that transaction was created before the block timestamp, which is effectively every 10 minutes. So once a transaction has been made immutable, nodes are free to remove them from their copy of the blockchain. Past transactions are not necessary for the process of creating new blocks and needlessly consume data storage. So if you are a node, you don't need to store the transaction data. What do you need to store then? For nodes to be able to remove individual transactions that have been placed in a block without affecting the integrity of the block hash, a data structure known as a Merkle tree is used. A Merkle tree enables a node to remove individual transactions from their record of a block and to retain only hashes of the transaction or even hashes of the branch the transaction was in. A node can provably show that the Merkle tree root used in the block header is the one used in the block hash even with access to a minority of the total transactions in the block. But that doesn't answer our question. So what does a node really need to keep? The block header. From the header, a node can see which block it builds upon, the time the block was discovered, and can validate the proof of work done by the node that discovered it. The Merkle tree's contents that include all of the transactions of the block are not a part of the header and are unnecessary to prove the existence of a previously validated block. We must begin to move beyond the limited concept of a blockchain as it blocks us from the unlimited potential of the ledger. This is because you do not need the entire blockchain. Rather, depending on what you are doing, you only need a particular piece of the overall ledger. So we have another true or false, another round of true or false. Uh, and here's the question. A full record of Bitcoin's proof of work for a single year only takes up 4.2 megabytes worth of space. I'll give you a second to answer that. And it is true. Since blocks are generated every 10 minutes, a block header is approximately 80 bytes, then 80 bytes multiplied by six, then by 24, and again by 365 is 4.2 megabytes. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Can everybody see my slides here, hopefully? So that right there, is the ledger. And I don't know if it zoomed in a little more here. Um, oops. If you imagine looking as far into the stars as your eyes can see, that limit is the minimum distance that light cannot traverse, also known as the boundary of infinity. You can even imagine a ledger much like the endlessness of hyperbolic space in that the potential is unbounded. One might say that the only boundaries to the Bitcoin SV ledger are the boundaries of our imagination and creativity, as well as our temporary software and hardware limitations. So I'm kind of burning through this pretty quickly here, but uh, this part, is really what 
I think uh, a lot of you are maybe here to learn about. So I'll try to slow down a bit now. Um, so now we know that the limits of the ledger are the uses that we cannot see. And in the last section, we learned about how nodes aren't necessarily the ones to keep transaction data. So before we find out who should, let's first figure out what kind of unlimited ledger Bitcoin is. Now it is my understanding that Bitcoin is a triple entry ledger. If you're not familiar with a triple entry ledger, it just has one more entry than a double entry ledger. Bitcoin as a triple entry ledger is quite an enhancement to the standard double entry ledger since the third entry is ordered and recorded into a mutable chain of blocks. This entry serves both as a transaction and a receipt, proving that an event occurred in a way that is vastly more profitable than that of a double entry ledger. To the point that falsifying or destroying entries is virtually impossible on the Bitcoin ledger. So Bitcoin allows for the first permanent objective and globally interoperable triple entry ledger, open to everyone and everything and bounded only by the limits of our minds. So if nodes don't, who does? It is perhaps a bit delusional to assume that every node must retain all of your transaction data forever. Since it doesn't make much sense for nodes to store it, the responsibility then becomes that of the users who made the transactions to retain their own copies of them. For those who don't want to go through the trouble of storing and managing their transactions, a profitable opportunity emerges. It makes sense to me that if it wasn't a business providing that service for a fee, then you would need to be responsible for your own data. So we can imagine an industry emerging in the curation, management, and archiving of transactions, perhaps in such a way that allows for a market in which peers can find and purchase ledger verified data. Not sure. Oops. Oh yeah. Sorry. That's uh, that's Waldo in there. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see my slides right now. <laughs> but uh, what what you're looking at is is Waldo, uh, which is always fun. Simplified payment verification allows a user with a set of block headers to build a verifiable history of all transactions that are relevant to their needs and provides a clear and simple means to demonstrate that proof to other peers on the network. This information, or I'm sorry, this is important for any application that builds upon information that is stored on the Bitcoin ledger and allows users to ensure that the information is valid and exists in a block. SPV is really important, although it is often downplayed. In my opinion, SPV is just as significant to the scalability of the Bitcoin ledger as unlimited block sizes. Because with the gigantic block sizes, you have gigantic user burdens and SPV scales down that user burden significantly. Brendan Lee described it perfectly in that if blocks were the Hoover Dam, a massive hydroelectric dam near Las Vegas, then SPV is the electrical socket in your wall. So as transactions are entered into blocks and blocks are accepted and built upon, then they are entered into the ledger. But the ledger itself does not necessarily exist within individual nodes. As we learned earlier, a node will most likely store an abbreviated version of the blockchain in the form of block headers and pruned block data consisting of transactions that contained unspent outputs. Most likely the ledger will be much too big in its eventual totality to be held by a single node. Rather, it will instead exist as an accumulation of data from many different sources as peers and nodes will specialize their function and form their part of the ledger by collecting the transactions and data that they value or are paid to value. The beauty of this is that despite this individualistic approach, any individual piece of information within the ledger can be validated 
So while a user may be completely unaware of how the data came to be, and even if it wasn't being held by any other peer familiar node, it can still be easily validated. And this is because each transaction can be proven to exist within a valid block through the Merkle branches, which connect the transaction ID all the way back up to the Merkle root contained within the block header. If the transaction can be proven to exist in the block, it can be shown to be a valid transaction written to the ledger and timestamped by the network. And so the ledger is really formed by the users, equipped with a set of block headers from which they build a verifiable history of all transactions relevant to them. And with the means to clearly and simply demonstrate that proof to other peers on the network. This is important for any application that builds upon information that is stored on the ledger and allows users to ensure that the information is valid and exists in a block. So what, will you, so what you will have is your ledger and what your ledger will be is the transactions that matter to you. Now, this picture at the top is not Vitalik riding on an Ethereum 2 unicorn. Rather, it is an interesting example of Native American ledger art, which was done on the pages of financial ledgers in the, eight, in the late 1800s. When young Plains warriors learned to draw in this new style, the pictures they made were incorporated into the war honor system of their society. The men would memorialize their deeds in pictures that they used as a part of their oral stories of bravery, victory, and loss. One of the more fascinating collections of which you can see an example below is Red Horse's pictographic account of the Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as General Custard's Last Stand. Although I've always felt a more, a more fitting name would be General Custer's Last Folly. The point is, is that as we're building our ledger now on Bitcoin, we, we've already started to do things that really have been done before in another way, in a non-virtual way. And so this is not particularly new, but it's just significantly better. And this is really kind of what the reason why it's better. The evidence, you know, point, uh, sorry, this is a picture. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, this painting of the, of the destruction of the Library of Alexandria, but it, it's, it's a pretty popular picture these days. And, uh, and really the evidence points to the Library of Alexandria uh, being in decline for many years before its eventual destruction. So, and this is a topic that is still heavily debated as to when and by whom uh, that it was destroyed. But uh, while we may not know how it was finished off, we can at least point our fingers at the Romans for initiating that decline. The point is though that countless important writings were lost, not just at the Library of Alexandria, but libraries all around the ancient world. We only have a tiny fraction of our recorded history and knowledge, and even that is a fraction of what actually went on in the ancient world. Somewhat ironically, the survival of ancient texts owes little to the great libraries of antiquity, and instead to the fact that they were exhaustively copied and recopied. Since entries on the Bitcoin SV ledger are in the form of a transaction between wallet addresses in the same distributed public ledger, each transaction is linked together in a system of permanent and objective records. This means we won't lose important things anymore. Now we have learned that Bitcoin is a system that provides honesty through transparency and incentives, and that it adds value when it's integrated into our applications because it gives us an extensive increase in capability that is much more than transferring money from A to B or price go up. We have learned that the ledger itself is dynamic, that users need not be burdened by the data of others. Instead, they can focus on what is needed for themselves, yet still benefit from the security, interoperability, and provability of a proof of work based global public ledger. With Bitcoin SV, the security burden that is placed upon digital businesses can be offloaded 
reducing the infrastructure and operating costs and other barriers to entry. We can provide the opportunity of new frontiers in interoperability and micropayments. We can provide secure data so that the programs that rely on it are not compromised or manipulated. In this case, the data on the Bitcoin SV ledger becomes the digital building blocks of a new renaissance. This future Bitcoin-based economy will be more productive than our contemporary one because people will know how to coordinate better with each other using the information that is in the ledger. People will be able to rely on the information that is in the ledger and it will be their virtual connection with everybody and everything. In essence, the Bitcoin SV, SV ledger allows for the world to cooperate. And Bitcoin rewards cooperation because cooperation allows for better success at profit seeking. So for the developers and entrepreneurs who want to be successful in Bitcoin, you have to be profit seeking. And by coordinating that profit seeking with others, the greater the benefit for yourself and every Bitcoiner. For so, those, so for those of you who want to participate in growing the real Bitcoin network, I urge you not to push, but rather to pull, which means instead of going around and trying to push everyone to join us, we instead leverage the Bitcoin SV ledger to build useful applications and services. And uh, I'm gonna end here in the hopes that we can have a, a discussion. I usually enjoy the benefit of having people uh, interrupt me. So <laughs> instead, I'd like to have a lot of questions and comments from all of you to make up for that. Uh, so again, I'd like to say thank you all very much. And I look forward to your questions and remarks. I have it. Yes, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just have to get you to unshare your screen so I can. Was it, how'd you like it? Is it all right? We're still live. Still live? Yeah, you can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we are still live. We're still, we're doing questions okay. now. Okay. Um, so um, we've got a question here from John Pitts. Um, what will a node do if you write eight gigabytes of data into a one token, uh, one Satoshi UTXO, a spendable one, right at the dust limit? Um, it seems top heavy for nodes to have to store. So I think he's going to the question of will, uh, will, will nodes keep data, um, et cetera. And uh, yeah, he's talking about embedding data in a spendable transaction, but it's very low value transaction. So, uh, so, and this, so yeah, and it's, uh, it's okay, a spendable. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is probably because nodes will have to, to store some transactions. Uh, you know, I, it'll, I'm sure there'll be specialized nodes that will try to, you know, that you can maybe offload such transactions to. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a question that I can't fully answer. I think part of the answer lies in the fact that um, uh, you, in order for a, um, a, a node to be able to validate transactions, they, they, they need to keep all of the spendable UTXOs because at some point, uh, if any miner has kept them, then any miner can mine that UTXO uh, or a transaction spending that UTXO into a block. And if you as a miner don't have it anymore, um, you simply can't validate that block, um, which puts you at a significant economic uh, disadvantage. Having said that, when you have these uh, these large large data payloads, um, you've got to remember that there's probably a I mean eight gigabytes is going to be a, a not in, inconsequential fee uh, attached to that. So um, the question will then arise uh, whether people will actually uh, want to um, whether people will actually want to um, uh, embed this data and store it on chain or whether they'll actually want to store it off chain and embed uh, embed hashes of the data. Um, I think we're going to see a, a wide mix of, um, of solutions there. Now, um, a question pops through, I think it was probably around halfway through um, your talk. Uh, someone asked, did you say nodes are not peers? Now, this is a, a common uh, point of confusion. Uh, simply because of the fact that peer, uh, and Owen touched on this as well, peer is a word that accurately describes 
the participants uh, that play different roles in different uh, different contexts. Um, mm-hmm. so it's actually quite accurate, I think, to talk about peers as uh, two users of the Bitcoin network being peers, uh, their peers mm-hmm. and share a protocol. And then uh, nodes um, uh, who are mining blocks uh, are also peers to each other. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not peers to users. Um, what's your take, sure. Kevin? Oh, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, nodes are peers to each other. Um, uh, but yeah, they're, I don't think they're necessarily, you know, peers to the users uh, they, because they're, you know, they're essentially the ones that are building the blocks that the, that the peers are, are creating by making transactions. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I would say they're definitely peers to each other. Mm-hmm. We've got one last question here, which is, um, I'm not sure it's specifically related to, uh, to your um, presentation, but it's, are we planning to remove the, the mempool too long limit? Um, it's the second time that this, uh, this question popped up today in a um, uh, also you know, unrelated context. And I don't think I've ever done any kind of broadcast event like this where, where the question hasn't been asked. Um, uh, I'll have a crack at answering it, and then if you've got anything you want to add, uh, Evan. Um, so, yes, we are planning to remove the limit. Uh, in fact, we did some tests uh, some time ago that show that um, uh, 50 uh, makes almost no performance difference to, um, to nodes. 100, uh, the, the difference is measurable, but, um, but barely so. Uh, and above 100 is where it starts to get a bit tricky. But there's a very large body of work going on in the Bitcoin SV no team right now to um to deal with the uh um the spaghetti code that we basically have to unwrap uh, around the part that um that is the reason why this this limit is there so um as i think i've probably said in a few uh public comments before uh immediately after genesis it became number one priority uh and we've had a significant team of engineers uh in the in the SV team working on it pretty much ever since um, it will definitely be uh, be gone before the end of this year. Um, it's just a question of uh, how close to the end of the year. Uh, I'm optimistic that we might have a, um, a release in a couple of months where um, the limit will, if not be gone, at least be very very substantially increased. Yeah, I think this kind of falls under the sort of limitations to the ledger being temporary and uh, and software or hardware related. So I, th- I think like pretty much every single limitation that we see today is going to eventually be uh, removed. And Steve has said that, of course, they're going to work to remove this. So I, I don't know how much longer it will be until we get to see just what uh, an unbounded uh, ledger looks like. But uh, I think we're getting pretty close, right, Steve? I think so, yeah. We're making leaps Great. and bounds. If you just measure awesome. the trajectory over the last 18 months and then project it forward, if, uh, yeah. if you're oh. making improvements at that rate, then, um, then we'll be an order of magnitude ahead of where we are right now. It's, it's incredible what's been accomplished in such a short time. Uh, okay. Um, this is a good so, one. When people say set in stone protocol, what, what does that actually mean? Well, uh, you know, to me, uh, it means quite clearly that the rules are, well, that a lot of the rules can't be changed. Um, and so that's, you know, if we look at a game and I, I, I talk to people, uh, you know, that have no understanding of, of Bitcoin or any of this stuff. And I, I kind of explained to them that, you know, if we're playing a game of, of soccer or, or football in, in England, um, and, I, and I say, oh, you know what, we're going to pick up the ball today and run around with it. You know, we're not playing soccer anymore, <laughs> you know, and that's the rules are fundamental to the, to the actual design of what we're doing. And in the case of Bitcoin, so many of these things have been sort of so many of these rules have been discarded to the point where you know we've had to essentially start over 
Um, and, and that's why it's so important that we make it so that, uh, that Bitcoin stays on the right track this time. And I think, you know, really what we saw uh, with, the, with the Genesis uh, upgrade was that uh, coming to fruition where all of a sudden uh, we do have this sort of uh, environment where nodes are going to need to be able to keep up with uh, a sort of a predetermined uh, sort of growth plan, which is being able to handle large amounts of transactions uh, and doing so in a way that uh, clearly follows the, the rules of Bitcoin. Okay, and we've got one, time for one last question here. Um, Adam asks if nodes, uh, mining nodes, uh, are not obliged to keep your data, then why should I pay for my file to be stored for, let's say, 24 hours uh, and then be deleted? Why, why should you pay? Well, I mean, it's not that you, that you shouldn't pay to do that. It's just that you should pay the right, the right, uh, the right entity to do that and uh, to store your transactions, right? So if the nodes aren't going to keep your transactions, uh, then there should be businesses that are able to do that for you and uh or you should be able to do that yourself um and then of course the referencing that comes from the transaction being processed onto the ledger is that is the proof of that uh of the existence of that um of that information so yeah uh, i think there's a lot of people that are kind of hoping that they will have their data stored forever uh, in the blockchain held by nodes, but I, I, it's not a, a likely scenario. Yeah, and I think it partly comes down to as well what, what it is that you're actually trying to, to pay for because uh, putting something onto the blockchain doesn't just provide storage as a, as a potential service, it also provides mm -hmm. um, immutability and, and proof of existence yeah. um, so that's potentially valuable for people but at the end of the day if you want to pay somebody to store uh, a piece of data uh, you're not going to have a hard time finding somebody uh, who's willing to take your money if you offer enough um, so Bitcoin yeah. I suppose operates like a free market in that sense and um, um, whether you want to derive the service from from miners or whether you want to derive the service from uh, from off chain entities uh, or partly off chain entities is um, is an economic choice. Thank you very much, Evan. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it.